And good morning. Uh, Good to see everybody. Uh, Most people who have been ill are recovering. Uh, They're here in the room today. Last week, uh, we knew quite a few people were getting sick and ticker, and uh, there was some positive uh, COVID tests uh, mixed among it. And of course, uh, nobody was hospitalized, I know of. Nobody missed more than a couple of days with flu-like symptoms. Though there is a persistent cough going around. So if you see someone like that, make the sign of the cross and, and just run away. Just, just, just run away. No. No. Uh, but be warned, there is a persistent cough that's going around. <coughs> the mind's not a cough. It's that maple donut I just had. Uh, mm, mm. It was worth it. Oh. Uh, I just wanted to mention before we begin, and we have a city prayer on Monday, uh, 1 o'clock, in the building next door. We pray for the city, the state. We pray for revival. Pray for revival. And with that being said, in the news is news of a revival breaking out, starting at Asbury and uh, in Kentucky and work as well. That actually happened in 1970. The similar story. They had an a evening service. And on a Sunday evening, this was in 1970, they had a Sunday evening service, and then the dean calls the chancellor, the president, or whatever the proper titles are, and says, hey, you know the Sunday night service? Yeah, it's still going. Right. They wouldn't go home. They just kept singing, just kept praying, just kept, and more would show up, and more, I mean, revival. And uh, I think about the things I see on, on the channels and on the internet. You know, was it just a week and a half ago or whatever else? I'm watching the death tolls in Turkey rise from an earthquake. You know, and just the devastation caused by it. And we're not immune to such things. And I think about that. And I think about these stories of revival and revival breaking out on other college campuses. And college campus driving in to be part of this. One of our bishops was on the way there two weeks ago, or two days ago. Uh, and amazing to see Revival. And tragic to see the devastation from earthquakes or floods or fires or whatever else. And it just reminds me, I am thankful and grateful for prayer. You know, because when I see the things that hurt, you know, I can pray. And when I see the things that encourage my soul, that in this world that revival still could happen, you know, uh, my heart sings. I can pray and thank God for the things that happen in this world. Pray with me. Gracious Lord, as we start this time together, this service, first and foremost, I ask that you meet us here, that between all the hustle and the bustle and the different things that can distract us, we focus on you and find you active and present in our lives, so much so it affects us the rest of the week and the month. Thank you for this time. Amen. And then real quick, was there anything else I should have mentioned and didn't? Now let us sing praises to the Lord. Hello.
There is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am, great I am, great I am, great I am, great I am. Majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. Good morning. Well, I'm just going to be honest with you. I feel like I've been rode hard and put away wet. <laughs> However, I listen to Mike say, Thanks, thank God for prayer. And I know that uh, we were all holding each other up in prayer. And I, I thought about how important our relationships are in this church, how we know each other, we pray for each other, we care about each other. And uh, I just thank you. Last Sunday after the potluck, um, Phil walked up with this big red bag full of containers and food. I want you to know that Don and I ate out of those containers all week. Every time there was a meal, I would say, do you want container one? Do you want container two? And we didn't even have to eat out of the same container. And I still have a little bit left at home that I've saved. So thank you. Thank you so much. Bow your heads with me. Relationships. 
Lord, prayer. Think about your word. I think about your disciples who would go out and, um, and knock on a door and say, do you, do you know about Jesus? I remember Jesus saying, now if you go into a town and they won't make you welcome, you just kick the dust off your feet and move on. And I think about the fact that in this church, we never have to worry about that, that everybody here knows, loves, and cares. We thank you for revival. I pray, Lord God, that this revival that we are hearing about is the beginning of the good work that you're going to do in this country to bring us back to the godly country that we were planned to be. Thank you for this time. Thank you for our music. Thank you, Lord, for our pastor. Thank you for just being there, always, always caring, always loving, always being there. In Jesus' name, amen.
glorify your name, glorify your name. We want to see you glorify. We want to see. Show me your way, show me your way. 
He came to fix my broken life. Please have a seat. We've uh, been going through, <clears throat> excuse me, we've been going through the book of Romans. Uh, we glanced over a few chapters. We've studied more in depth of a few chapters. <clears throat> it was just a few weeks ago we looked at Romans 7, which I called one of the most controversial chapters in the New Testament because of the way what's being said and how it's interpreted. Uh, however, this week as I was researching some of the things, I found a sermon online that said Romans chapter 9, the most controversial chapter uh, in the Bible. Uh, well, not just one of them. It was it. This is it. This is what is this saying is it. Uh, my only hope here, and again, I said there's guys with PhDs and all sorts of numbers behind, letters behind their names. There's, this argument has gone back and forth on what exactly this is saying for some time. Is Mike from Fernley going to fix that? Probably not. Uh, my hope, though, is to show uh, the context that I see helps me to understand the passages being spoke of. Now, last week, uh, well, I mean, technically we went, uh, Romans 1 was the cosmological argument, men are without excuse. We talked about chapter 3, which a quick way of summing up some of chapter 3 is people like to sin. Most everybody could read that, could read the passage I'm talking about, should be able to go, wow, this thing's really saying that people like to sin. And based on the front page of the newspaper and the, you know, yes, indeed, uh, it is true. Uh, always and even in our rural community, you know, there's another drug bust, there's another high-speed chase, there's, an, you know, uh, not to mention the more acceptable sins of society. Uh, taking place all the time, all the time. Uh, went into Romans 6, and we call that one, don't sin, don't abuse God's grace. Very clearly, that's what I was talking about. Then in Romans 7, what's that whole passage on I want to do, which I don't want to do, and the things I want to do? Some people apply that to modern-day Christianity. I suggest it based on the context it's talking about living your life under the law, specifically the Jewish law, the codes, the rituals, the customs. Then in chapter 8, uh, we still see some of that talk. I mean, chapter 8, which was last week, I think it was a, it was a two, was that one, two-parter? I think it was two different weeks. Uh, it starts off with, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. It also says, uh, because through Christ, uh, Jesus, Christ, uh, Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives you life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And again, that Comparison between life in the Spirit, New Testament living, and life by the code, the written ritual code. It goes on to say, last we uh, chapter 8, And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And we talked a bit about knowing that you can know there's a God. Not just in what you read, you know, but inside, internal. Not everyone's got this one figured out. I showed that clip of John Wesley's life where he was trying to work his way through that. It goes on to say, at the, at, towards the end of chapter 8, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And it goes on to height and depth. And, you know, all right? and finally, one of the things he says is, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. Uh, I bring these things to refresh your memory, but also to make an interesting point. He ends that on a, a crescendo. I mean, I mean, it is some sort of a, you know, he's talking about what can separate us from Christ's love and more than conquerors. And the last part of that passage, I said, they're power verses, I call them. These are ones you got to highlight. These are ones you should memorize. <clears throat> 
Well, then, as chapter 8 comes and goes, and I should mention that in the original languages, they didn't have the paragraph and chapter breaks and periods. In fact, if you've ever seen some of the ancient writing, it is just every word stuck next to each other, right? Just rows and rows of letters, you know, this way for the Greek or that way for the Hebrew, right? Uh, rows and rows of letters. And, of course, if you know, a lot of times it's even shorthand. It, it involves the consonants and not the vowels, kind of a shorthand. But if you know the words enough, you'll see those things on, on Facebook and things like that. If you can read this, you're extra smart, and the letters are backwards, and you know, and the thing actually says, if you can read this, and it's with wrong letters, you know, but you can read it. So it's not impossible to read something with all the words stuck together and missing consonants or vowels or whatever. Uh, but there is, and they put the chapter breaks and the numbers to help us find things. Nothing wrong with that. And sometimes where the chapter breaks is debated among scholars. I don't, I don't debate that in this particular one. Uh, I think it's a fine place to put a chapter because something changes drastically from all those power verses I just talked about. You know, all the more the conquerors, all the neither, what's going to separate us, is it going to be hardship or this? Or, you know, you know this, all these powerful verses. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. Now he's making a statement. You know, I'm not lying. I got this. You know, it's in my conscience. It confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying. Now, is he talking about what he just said or what he's about to say? That's where the argument comes in sometimes. Right? Well, clearly what he just said was good stuff, so I, would, I can easily apply that verse. He's speaking the truth. He's not lying. The Holy Spirit testifies these things. Remember I said the, the word spirit is used more in Romans 8 than most any other chapter. Much like the word law or commandment in chapter 7 is used, helping me understand what it might be talking about. Then he says in verse 2, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Now that's quite a change. From all those things he just got through saying, too, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. I have great sorrow and increase in anguish in my heart. Why? I mean, just think of all the things he just got through saying. Why would you flip the coin and say, oh, I just don't feel great. I'm hurting deep. I'm hurting, cutting, hurting deep. Right? Well, he explains it in verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race. Now, if you're just reading this, like, I think today I'll just read Romans chapter 9, you're not going to get what's going on. However, if you've been following along and you've been talking about the argument of the law versus was the law bad? No, the law wasn't bad, but it created in me that sin took an opportunity, it abused the law. We now live by the Spirit, not by the letter of the law, right? You read through all those things. Uh, and then you get to this point, I wish I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ. Who wishes that? But he's speaking for the sake of my people, those of my own race, Jewish people. The Apostle Paul was very Jewish. And uh, he's wishing that they weren't in the boat they're in. Why would he say this here and now? Because he's just got through saying how the law was ineffective. Well, who follows the law? Jewish people. So this makes sense that by all the things he's just got through saying, saying we don't live by the law, we live by the Spirit, we don't. Well, what about all those people living by the law? Is an obvious question. What about the Jews who are still doing these things, who haven't accepted the Messiah, who haven't turned the page into the New Testament, if you will? He says he wished he could be cut off for their sake. He says, those of my own race. He explains even further what he's talking about. Verse 4, the people of Israel. And look what he says. Theirs is the adoption of sonship. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs and from, from, verse 5, from the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. And we've talked about that, all these different things throughout the Old Testament, pointing towards the coming Messiah. Now, I think after reading this, there is no guesswork as to who he's talking about. I mean, he just said, people of my own race. But that's not enough. Verse 4 was, the people of Israel. Well, that certainly narrows it down. 
And then he mentions adoptions of sonships, divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, and the temple worship. Well, those directly correlate to everything he's just been talking about. It isn't just a new random thought. He's still building and explaining on the things he's talked about. And theirs are the patriarchs, the Abrahams, the Isaacs. Theirs are the, uh, from them is traced the human answer of the Messiah. All that is wonderful. But what's he trying to explain? Why is he bringing this up? Verse 6. It's not, it is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descendants from Israel are Israel. <clears throat> He's making a point. God's word didn't fail, and the Jews just didn't make it in. He's making a point that everyone who says they're of Israel aren't really of Israel, the, the proper and again, when he used it, this is a hard one for some people to hold, because Israel was a person in the Old Testament. But it's also a name for the nation. You know, and there's that, sometimes people get those two confusing. Usually by context, you can figure out which one he's talking about. You know, but some people do, you know, you see that name, what's, what's he got to do with it? Where'd he come from? Why is he being brought up right now? If you haven't, again, chapter by chapter, get a figure, move on to the next one. And I don't say this as some sort of super special secret Bible study trick. This is how we speak. Each sentence builds upon a previous sentence to convey thoughts and details for a topic. And if the topic changes enough, we call that another paragraph. Right? That's how we talk. That's how the Bible is written, especially in these letter epistles. Uh, the stories of Jesus are a collection of different things he did. Uh, not necessarily you have to read it chapter by chapter. You don't. Because it's not being told exactly at you know, this. You know, he said he went and taught these things here. And he went over here and taught similar things. Well, you can just read those parts by themselves and you really haven't lost context. It's Jesus teaching. But here, this is a letter format, epistolary or whatever they call it. In the, uh, each chapter is building, just like regular conversation. So this stuff makes much more sense if you've been following along. Chapter, and I've encouraged everyone, go home and reread the chapter. It won't take you five minutes. And watch how much more stuff just gets locked in on what's being said. It's not as though God's word had failed. For not all those who are descended from Israel are Israel. However you want to interpret that. He's just got through saying, however you want to interpret the word Israel. He's just got through saying that not everybody there is Israel. You know? and, and he could be talking about the borders of the property. Uh, the country. Just because you're inside the border of the country doesn't mean you're an Israelite. Right? Just because you're inside the borders of the United States of America doesn't mean you're a, you know, a nat natural born citizen or even a legal citizen. Right? These things happen. So just because you're there doesn't mean you're one of them. That's what he's saying. Verse 7, nor because they are, the de are his descendants are, of, are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Now, we just quoted the Old Testament. Abraham had two sons, if you read the story. Old Testament story, book of Genesis stuff. He had two sons. One, he was told, even though you're old, even though your wife's old, you're going to have a son. God tells him this. Well, if you read the story, Abraham's like, well, I need to have children. My wife's really old. But the servant gal, she's kind of young. You know, she would be a nice mother for my children. And he kind of comes up with his own plan to help God along. And hence was born uh, Ishmael from Hagar, the, the servant slave gal. Uh, later, he would actually have a child with his wife who he didn't think he could have a child with. Uh, Isaac. Am I getting those names right? Uh, Sometimes when I talk about these, I, my, my brain will start grabbing the wrong name from the story of Joseph, and the, you know, so follow me along. And uh, Every now and then I, I reverse them. I don't mean to, but I do, especially if someone has like two names. That's not helping at all, right? Uh, and of course, what, what was Israel called before he was called Israel? Jacob. Yeah, Jacob. So that doesn't help me either. The guy has two names, you know, or Abram to Abram to Abraham. Or, uh, so follow me along. I'll try not to get this too messed up. The Apostle Paul now has just made reference to 
nor because they are the descendants of Abraham, or they are Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through your offspring. The promised line of the Messiah, the promised working of God with the nation of Israel, did not come through the firstborn son, which is naturally the way the inheritance and blessing is passed on. There's a name for that. Uh, primogenitor. Primogenitor. Anyone ever heard that word? It can be used in a couple of different ways. Sometimes it's used as an ancestor, your forefather, your primogenitor, the first, you know, type of thing. But it's also used more likely when we talk about royalty and the passing on of royalty. The primogenitor is the firstborn oldest male. England did change the rule to include firstborn daughters and such. Oh, not too long ago, 100 years ago, or whatever it was. Uh, but they, half a century? This century. This century? Okay. It wasn't that long ago as far as world history goes. Uh, but no, they did, they did change it up, so it's not just the male. But it generally means that male line of uh, blessing and inheritance passed on to the firstborn child, firstborn male child. Well, that's not happening here. And he explains why. Because God never said you're going to have a kid with your handmaiden, and that's your firstborn son. His original initial plan was you will have a child with your wife. And so he still went with that. Uh, he still went with that. Isaac would become the, you know, the f- God, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, he's part of that, the patriarchs. Why is he saying this? Because he just got through saying, not everybody who's in the confines of Israel is Israel. He's also saying not everybody <clears throat> who automatically belongs to it, is in, I guess is what we're trying to say. Just because you're in the boundaries of the state doesn't mean you're in the hierarchy. You're going to be able to vote. You know, you're not part of the family. You're not part of the clan. Uh, they're not part of it. And he explains by bringing up that, you know, there was two sons. Both had the same dad, but God was only going to work through one line of that specifically, the one he had picked, the one he had chosen. Uh, and he says in verse 8, in other words, it's not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. And again, there's some part here where he's talking about, he's talking about Israel. Remember, we just read that. My, heart, my heart's in anguish for the people of Israel, my race, my people. Theirs is the covenant, theirs is the law, theirs, you know. Uh, the, the, the conclusion would be that not all of them are going to ca- are catching on. Just because they're part of Israel doesn't mean they're going to catch on to the true stuff. The true stuff of God is what he's saying. <clears throat> this still happens to this day. Uh, I meet people who are positive their religiousness, their Christianity, their salvation is based on an ancestor. Isn't that kind of funny? I still meet them, meet them to this day. You know, hey, y'all go to a local church. My uncle was a Presbyterian minister. Okay, so what? You know, what about you? But to them, that's it. That's their, their, their pathway to heaven. It's some great grandfather, uncle, cousin, whatever, is a minister of some sort in some group of somewhere. I think there's more involved than that as far as entrance into heaven goes. I mean, that'd be nice. We just have to check our family trees out, find some religious dude and say, hey, we're with that guy. I mean, that's easy. That's good. I mean, most of us could be able to find someone up and down the family tree at some point or another we could claim, you know. In fact, I, I think it's funny sometimes. I don't have a problem with genealogy studies per se. Uh, but when someone thinks it really changes something, you know, well, my great-great-great-grandfather, my mother's side was a direct descendant of, you know, uh, the second John Quincy Adams, you know, means absolutely nothing today. You're not going to get any special bonus points. You're not going to get a tax break. No one's really necessarily going to come out and even ask for your autograph. You know, because your second great third cousin's uncle on your brother's side was related to John Quincy Adams. You know, it's just, again, it's neat to see that stuff. It's neat to find out. I said recently I found out uh, my, my, gene, my genetics. I didn't know I was mostly English and Irish. No clue. I was adopted. You know, so I mean, I'm not against it. I'm not against it. It was neat to find out that stuff. Uh, but is the queen going to ask me a question now that I found out most of my genetics are from the great, you know, the, the English island? Not, almost 90% of my DNA is on the English island between Irish 
Scottish, and English Welsh. Does that mean anything? Are English people going to call me up in Nevada and ask me questions? No. No, no, they're not. Why? Because even though I have 90, near 90% 90 English DNA, I'm not English. I was born in America, raised on the West Coast. You know? In fact, by East Coast standards, I may not even be an American because I was raised on the West Coast. You know? Uh, these things are true. He's making the point that not everybody who looks like they're in are in. That's kind of the point he's making. But it's the children of the promise who regarded as Abraham's offspring. Verse 9, for this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Sarah will have a son. Not your slave girl, not you. Sarah will have a son. That's how it was stated. And we have this thing I talked about where everyone's positive their ancestry does something for them. Uh, John the Baptist sees the Pharisees and Sadducees coming out to see the revival taking place, so to speak. They're all coming out to see what's going on. And he says to them, I'll just mention it to you, you may know the story. He says, and do not say to yourselves, we have Abraham as your father. If that's your biggest claim to fame, that Abraham was your great, 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 great ancestor, uh, don't say that. He says, for I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Right? You know, even these rocks and stones can become children of Abraham in God's way of doing things. He's God's power, God's... Yeah, yeah, sure. Which means what? That you claiming you're Abraham's children doesn't have all that to it that you think it does. And we talked about this before. God is very concerned about the motive of why you do things. Not just a list of do's and don'ts. He's much more concerned about the motive as to why you do things. The actual condition of your heart. So much so, he's actually offered to help. A new heart. A new way of seeing things through the power of the Holy Spirit and never to be alone again. To have help alongside of you. <clears throat> That's what the New Testament speaks of. So he goes on now. Uh, and I mentioned this last week. That some people will interpret this. And we could use the term hyper-Calvinism, if anyone's ever heard that term. John Calvin was a reformer, started off in Geneva. A lot of his teachings spread up through the uh, north, made it into Scotland with John Knox. So Scotland was very reformed, is a word used for that type of tradition. And from his views on Scripture, and a lot of people follow, I mean, the Methodist Church follows John Wesley's teachings to a certain degree, uh, at least we used to, uh, uh, you know, Luther follows Martin Luther. I mean, you know, it's, it's not uncommon. I would say the difference when we're talking about a man starting a, a movement or a denomination is I can stand here and say, you need not ring a single word that John Wesley ever said. And you can be just as much a child of God as anybody else. Now, do I think there's stuff he said worth reading? I certainly do. But it's not about him. Martin Luther is the same way. You can read your Bible. You never need to know who Martin Luther was. And when I say Martin Luther, a lot of people think I mean Martin Luther King, Jr. I don't. I mean the German reformer in the 1500s or whatever it was, doing his thing. Martin Luther, the main, the first guy. In fact, Martin Luther King, Jr. was a Lutheran minister named after Martin Luther. You know, since this is a junior, my guess is his dad had a similar name. Uh, also named after Martin Luther. And you'll meet John Wesley, someone who named their kid after. There was a famous gunfighter, murderer, John Wesley Harden. His parents were Methodists. Him, not so much, you know. Right? So, I mean, it goes on. That is the promise. So, again, my uncle, my grandfather. The reason I bring this up is that some of this part about, you know, Abraham's our father. We're part of the, we're part of the chosen group we're in. No. No. Because it's not about who you know. It's about what you're feeling and why. <clears throat> uh, and he goes on in verse 10. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born, her had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose and election might stand. Uh, not by works, but by him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. And then it says, verse 13, just as it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Have to talk about a lot of things to explain what just took place here in these few passages. But let's go back. He talked about Abraham had two kids 
but one was God's chosen path. Most everyone should get that one. He makes the same point here. Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time. They were twins. That usually has to be about the same time, you know. Uh, yet, before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. Same point as made before. The primogenitor thing is all out of whack, right? God works that way. I would say to this day, God chooses the unlikely candidates. Why? So you know it's him. You know, it's not that all the famous preachers and saviors are all, you know, perfect lives, perfect people. A lot of them didn't come to, you know, didn't strung it on drugs, some people, before they find the Lord. It's part of their story, you know. Uh, embroiled in all sorts of sinful desires until they found the Lord. Not all of them are perfect. He uses imperfect people, which I find is a source of great hope. Because he can use me too then, can't he? And you should feel the same way. Sometimes when you feel down and out, sometimes when you feel like you're failing. Uh, you might be, and there might be something to work on, don't get me wrong. But there's a point where, you know, even as imperfect as I may be, God could use me. And you think about some of the power players in the Bible. You know, Moses, I want you to go in there, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Do you guys remember what Moses said? Basically, oh no, I can't. <laughs> you want someone else. <coughs> Excuse me. You want someone else. I can't go. I'm not a good talker. I can't go. He goes on several, you know, you know Gideon, the leader, the, the, the judge. Well, if you really want me to know it's you, make this part wet and that part dry. Then the next day, okay, make this part dry, then that part wet, and then the next day, you know, it goes on. These are, these are movers and shakers of the Bible, and they are men, men who are capable of fearing what's to come, men are uncertain, men are, you know, again, it brings me great hope, great hope. In fact, it was early on, some of the folks from AA were here. I was going through some Old Testament characters, and I remember uh, one particular person reported, uh, these guys need AA. You know, he was, it was talking about some of the patriarchs, the way they carried on, the things they did, the life of Samson, you know. That guy could use some AA, and he was right in saying so. They were very, very human. Uh, but again, if God could work with them, do mighty things with them, what could he do with us, with you, with me? Uh, these are... Even if I've messed my life up, yes. Even if you've messed your life up. I actually played a sermon uh, and set it out to people four years ago when I was at annual uh, general conference. The man speaking had been in prison for 17 years uh, of his part in a drive-by shooting. Right? And uh, should you be on his Facebook, you can tell he is a powerful tsunami of God, constantly heading to different places, constantly preaching, constantly working three, four campuses in the L.A. area. Most recently, they're building a house for, for people to recover and grow, you know, a, a place to house men. Um, amazing story from the most unlikely candidate. These give me hope. And here, it's, but, but I digress, but here we're talking about uh, there was two twins, but it wasn't the first one because God had said the older will serve the younger. Part of God's plan. What is his point? Well, the main point, based on context, is God doesn't always work the way you think you should. And you just got to say, not all in Israel are Israel. Well, not all firstborns are technically firstborns. It's, I guess the, a simple way of saying what we just read. He's making that point. Why? Because God does what he wants to do. Now, I mentioned before a thing called hyper-Calvinism. I mentioned this last week. It is a thought and a practice that God has set so everything up His will. We can't change it. We can't move it. We can't touch it. We are all just going in the flow of God's will. And I've even read paragraphs on even if you think you have a free will idea, you don't. God just allowed you to, which means it wasn't that much free will anyway. I mean, really, think, and you just sit there and some, and some of us would scratch our heads like, what's being said? Some people take this to such an extreme. That's what I'm talking about right now is the extreme view uh, that, well, we don't need to have missionaries. We don't even need to pray. 
Right? There's no reason to even support God's work because God's got it all figured out. You know? And it leads to a, a lot of, uh, you don't have to do anything. Now, I can see that being a logical conclusion. If God has everything set up, if God, you know, that could be a logical conclusion. But what I would argue is, however, the Bible tells you to pray. Jesus teaches you to pray. It tells you to be kind and giving. It tells you to pray for, you know, it tells you to send missionaries. It talks about sending support and help and guidance. And it talks about church hierarchy and government. And we're, well, if it says all those things, how can we just simply fold our hands and go, we don't have to do any of those things. So Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. And he was very, very stern with them as he was many, many times. He says some along the lines of, you nullify the word of God because of your tradition. He tells them, then he explains. They say all their money has been given to God, all their wealth, all their whatever material possessions. So should they die, it goes to the church, it goes to the temple, it goes to the synagogue, whatever. Which sounds great, sounds holy, sounds noble. But Jesus says, but you're not honoring your father and mother. You're telling them, I'd like to help you, but my money's tied up. So you have your tradition, which is nullifying, honor your father and mother, a commandment of God. Right? You are nullifying the word of God with your tradition. Uh, he says these things. He explains these things. He tells them these things. And, and here we have the apostle trying to explain something similar. What was Jesus? Jesus called them hypocrites, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Which again, we use the word, you don't practice what you preach, you're a hypocrite. And the word is used that way, but in Greek it also means actor. He's calling them pretenders. He's calling them imposters. They're playing a part of being ultra-religious, but their hearts are far from God. So much so, they thought bumping off the Messiah was a good idea. How's that for being corrupt and not knowing what God was doing? So, and there's that final line, just as it is written, verse 13, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. I'm talking about that hyper-Calvinism again. They look at this verse and go, there you see, one person's automatically loved by God and another person is hated by God. And this becomes a whole series of God's already picked who's going to follow God and Christ and God's already decided who's not. Can't be changed. Said, done, deal. And from that, again, you get a lot of why bother trying? You're in if you're in, no matter how you behave, and you're out if you're out, no matter how you behave, and who you, you, know, you can't follow God because he hasn't allowed it, and you're going to follow God whether you like it or not. You know, And that's actually some thoughts of this extreme view of predestination of God's will, God's sovereignty. I'm not saying that God isn't sovereign. God doesn't have a plan. God doesn't have a purpose. He sort of does. He's certainly, we're reading about some of his plans. You think the plans to your firstborn son, but I have a plan to your nextborn son. I mean, we're reading this. But back to the point, when you have hold some views so much that you can't do the other verses, maybe you've gone a little too far. Well, from this verse, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, comes some of those thoughts that some people are in and some people are out. Now, this flies in the face of all sorts of verses that say like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth. When a person reads that, they think it might be a bit more widespread than just a certain elect few scattered throughout time and history. And we know, based on what Jesus said, a lot of people are on the broad road that leads to destruction and less few are on the narrow road that leads to righteousness. These are the, you know. So we have every reason to believe not everyone's going to catch on. But again, I'm not talking about that view. I'm talking about the view where why bother? It's all said and done. The why, I, I don't have to do anything. The other verses don't make any sense. <clears throat> Jacob I loved, Esau I had. I should explain. Uh, the word hated there isn't used exactly like we use the word hated. Right? And even then, we can say someone, someone like, I hate that person. I truly hate that person. And, and you could mean that if they were in the crosswalk, you'd have a hard time hitting the brakes. You know, If you saw them on the side of the road, you would laugh and wave and keep going. I mean, you hate them. But we also use it in different senses, different tenses. I hate going to the dentist. 
Does that mean I'm not going to go to the dentist? Well, no, depending on tooth pain, I might run to the dentist. I still hate going there, but not so much that I won't go there. Right? We're using the same word hate, but in a different sense. Well, the general thought here is Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Now, he's actually quoting uh, from two different passages. When he says the older will serve the younger, he's quoting from Genesis 25. When the apostle Paul reads, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, he's quoting from Malachi, the book of Malachi, one of the last books in the Old Testament. And between those two points in time is like 1,500 years. So to say that Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, did he hate Esau? Well, we know that Esau was a hunter, rugged, outdoorsman type, you know. And we know that when uh, is Jacob slash Israel returns, he's trying to butter him up and make sure his older brother doesn't try to bump him off. He's sending him provisions and you know care packages. I'm, I'm paraphrasing greatly. He's sending him all these uh, troops and things are going before him. And he has a lot of possessions. So you really can't think that God was cursing him then and there. Right? Generally, it's thought that when it says this, it means in a comparison sense. Compared to Jacob, he less loved Esau. Jacob was more loved or, or uh, uh, something along those lines. Now, it happens in the New Testament. It happens in the New Testament. Jesus said this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father or mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26. Now, when I first ran across that, I'm like, wait a minute. Did Jesus, who talks about love, 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 and the New Testament's about love, he just said you're supposed to hate people? Right? Well, he's using it in the same sense. Not as hatred, but as less loved. Right? You should love God, the Lord, your Savior, more than your father or mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters. He's just that much more. He's the Messiah. They're not. However, the New Testament tells us to honor our father and mother. It tells us to treat people like brothers and sisters. It says if a man doesn't take care of his immediate family, he is worse than an unbeliever. I don't know how you become worse than an unbeliever, but that's what the sentence says. Right? Well, how can you say all these things and you're supposed to out and out hate them? Well, the two don't go together. You can't hate the people and do all these nice things for them and care for them. And if you don't care for them, you're worse than an unbeliever. No, it's, it's that same type of, it doesn't work as good in English, but instead of the word hatred, less loved might be, less preferred, less loved might be a better way of saying it to make more sense. Because again, if you use hatred like hatred, it doesn't make any sense at all when Jesus says you're supposed to hate these people because he tells you to keep loving them. Furthermore, Deuteronomy 23, Deuteronomy 23 verse 7, do not despise an Edomite, which is the people of Esau. It's Transjordan. If you know where Israel is, you know where the Dead Sea is, the Jordan, that side. You know, the other side of the Mississippi, so to speak. You know, the East Coast. Well, it's kind of like that. It's on the east side. Right? And it says... Do not despise them. It explains why. For the Edomites are related to you. It even goes on to say, do not despise an Egyptian because you resided as foreigners in their country. Do you know what else appears in that same chapter? A commandment not to associate with Moabites. It says some, some other races, they can join the assembly of God in three generations. Now, even though great-great-grandmother was a practicing whatever, you know, You've been around enough to the generations, you're, you're part of Israel. You can be part of the assembly, part of the worship, part of the whole package. In that same chapter, it says, Moabites you cannot marry with, ever. Not in three generations, ever. And we know if you trace back Jesus' lineage, a Moabite shows up. It's in the book of Ruth, you know. And that is King David's great-grandma, I think it is. Great-grandma, give or take a, give or take a great. What was that? I said, however many greats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give or take a great. It's a great-great or a great-grandmother. It's not that far back. That's a Moabitess. They came from Moab, you know. Uh, and here, she even, Ruth even tries to get, no, no, send her, get them on back to her people. 
not the people of Israel. Right? Clearly, not one of the Israelites. And even though she's a Moabitess, and even though there's a commandment against it, we see God using it. So just because it says, Jacob, I hated, uh, doesn't necessarily mean hate the way we think. And just because something is considered bad or wrong, doesn't mean God can't use it. I just got through saying, he uses all sorts of people's lives that way. Now, it gets a little more, uh, 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 it goes on from here. Uh, Here's a funny one. As I talked about the extreme view that some Calvinists take, there's more medium views, more in the, in, the, in the center views. And that is, we often, you can hear the term, once saved, always saved. Right? Our eternal security. Once you are in God, you are in, and there's nothing you can do to fall out. Many churches teach, I'm pretty sure you're in, but I wouldn't encourage you to walk away. I'm not saying you've mixed church one Sunday or you hit your thumb and say a naughty word, you're automatically out. I've never met too many. I'm sure there's someone out there that believes that, but I haven't met too many of them. Uh, is the thought that you're... Now, it depends on what you do with this thought, right? It depends on what you do with this thought. If you think, you know, my dad's a judge, he would never put me in jail, that's great. But if you think, now I'm going to commit a lot of crimes, that's not so great, so I know people who think that, you know, God, they're in, they're good, they're, they're, they have this, we'll say, this general form of Calvinism. And for them, it works. They try to be good people. And here's the funny thing. Even though there may be very different views on this controversial passage, we have to come up with some of the same conclusions. For instance, uh, I think maybe, you know, whosoever believeth is whosoever. You know, Christ Jesus is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. But he's the savior of all men, whether they ever figure it out or not, or choose to follow him. It's the way I interpret that. So this causes me to see anybody as a possible candidate for the kingdom of heaven. And I know many people who are much more down the Calvinistic road who are positive that only some people are in and some people are out. Right? Completely different view. However, guess what? They don't know which ones are which. God doesn't tell us that. So what do they have to do? Preach Christ to all. Right? We have two very different approaches with the same outcome, priest Christ to all. Furthermore, we could, some people could put it a person and said, that person used to go to church, used to pray, used to, you know, they were so into it, and now they've fallen away. Well, one side could say they were in, now they're out. The other side could say, well, technically they were never in, they were just fooling themselves, because you can't fall out. Therefore, they were just fooling themselves. Now, those are two completely different reasons. However, they both agree on what? That guy ain't living his life like he should. So even though there's two different approaches to it, you end up with the same conclusion. Uh, I can work with people like that. I can really, I really can. We have, a, we have enough in common. We can, we can work together. As far as the, the uh, extreme view, I would encourage you to always avoid certain religious extremes. It seems like men are common of doing it, and it's not always beneficial. And whether that is an extreme view of all sorts of religious rules or codes or a desire to get rid of all religious rules and codes. You know, we're not going to have a pastor. We're not going to have a, a teacher. We're just going to sit still and look forward. And I mean, I've been to some actual worship services that were like that, and they actually worked out okay. Uh, but that was, you know, that was not a full-time way of doing it. You know, the Bible talks about teachers. So to say you don't need a teacher... So those are, those are verses you don't need? Is that what you're saying? You know, the word pastor is used in there, and elder and deacon, to say these aren't parts of the church. You know, I'll just sit still and stare forward and let the Spirit work. Uh, and again, I have been to some at work, but I wouldn't say that's the, I wouldn't say that's the outline we see in the Bible is how a church should work. I see a certain order. Uh, and I'm just going to speed through a little bit more of this. It's, it's getting a lot later than I thought. And he goes on. What shall we say then? Verse 14, is God unjust? Not at all. Unjust about what? About some of Israel catching on and some not catching on. About one son being used but not the other son. That's what I think he's talking about. Uh, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Verse 15, I will have compassion on whom I will compassion. It It is actually a very common biblical theme that we as humans just don't get it all. Now, the Bible reveals all sorts of things and whys and what God's up to and what he's planning, 
all the verses pointing towards the coming Messiah was certainly some clues. We weren't left in the dark about that. But to say that we have it all figured out, that we understand the mind of God, God's going to have mercy on whom he's going to have mercy and compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse 16, it does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. And again, human desire or effort. We already read their, their, their hope was their father was Abraham or their descendants of Isaac or whatever else. It doesn't depend on these things. It doesn't depend on Abraham's work to try to help God out and have a son. I'm just based on all the things we've just read. It goes on, verse 17. For the scripture says, Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Now, from this gets the idea that everybody's just a pawn in God's plan. Well, I'm not so, I'm, I think, thinking of ourselves as pawns and him as the master chess maker might be a, a decent uh, analogy. I mean, what, what do we understand on the battlefield as pawns compared to the overall picture a chess master understands? Uh, that certainly works. But again, does it mean that extreme view which then nullifies all the other verses? Some people read that in here. That's all I'm saying. That this, God's in charge of everything, and then we do nothing. Therefore, God has shown mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, verse 18. And he hardens who he wants to harden. <clears throat> One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who is able to resist his will? If God made us this way, we can't do much better. Whose fault is it? God's fault is kind of a common, still works to this day. People still have this idea. And he comes back with that same point, but you are a human being to talk back to God. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Verse 21, does the potter have the right to make out the same lump, to make out the same lump of clay for some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Same clay, two different outcomes. You can make out of clay your foods and dishes and pots and pans or what have you. For eating, food is touching that. With the same clay, you could make a container to hold the trash or to take care of the nighttime functions, you know, the old pot, so to speak. Right? All these are made out of the same clay, the good, the bad, the stuff for common use, the stuff for normal use. He's making that point that we're not going to understand God completely. We're not. He says in verse 24, even us whom he called out, not only from Jews, but also from Gentiles. Now he's saying that God, in all of his might, his power, his understanding, he can make clay any way he wants to. He's now called out true believers, not just from Jews who understand, but from Gentiles. And most of us in this room qualify as Gentiles. We were not raised in the Jewish faith with the customs and codes. He goes on, and look what he starts quoting now. He's talking about Christians. Verse 25, and it says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. He's going after someone else. His now, God's true believers will be Gentiles and Jews. He makes this point over and over again to the verse uh, 26. In the very place where it said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. It was declared by God, you are no longer my people, but the time will come in the same place you will be called, you are my people. All these should mean something to you if you've ever felt on the outside. Isaiah cries out concerning us, though the, verse 27, though the number of Israelites be like to sand on the sea, only a remnant will be saved. Even though they're numerous, not all of them are going to make it. He's quoting Isaiah. <clears throat> and what's he talking about? Those who live by the law who have the law, because he keeps saying that to the last several chapters. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. Uh, verse 29, he quotes Isaiah. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us to sense we would become like Sodom, we would have become like Gomorrah. Then he goes on to say, verse 30, What shall we say then, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? A righteousness by faith, verse 31, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not gained, attained their goal. Is that what's being said? 
Right? Think about it. Those are those two by the Spirit, by the law. Same points that being made earlier, still connected. Right? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, a righteousness through faith, as by faith, in verse 31. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not obtained their goal. And he did talk about the law doesn't work for final righteousness. And look at, ver- look at verse 32. Why not? Yeah, that is what I'm saying. You got it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, verse 33, See, I lay, a, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Zion was usually a term referred to the holy hill on which the temple stood. It's also used you know, as a, you know, the area of Jerusalem, Zion. You know, it was good when it said, let's go into the house of the Lord, let's go to Zion. You know, there's all sorts of, this word pops up, Zion. See, I lay a stone in, uh, in Zion, I lay a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. He's talking about Zion, talking about Jerusalem. There's going to be a stone, a foundation, some sort of block, if you will. Because stones then, we're not talking pebbles. You know, the building blocks that make the walls are massive, the stones around. And you can trip over it. That's what it's saying. Right? It's a rock, a stone, and you can stumble over it, a rock that makes them fall. So in the middle of the way in Jerusalem, there's something in the way. And then the rest of the verse explains, too, the one who believes in him, well, now the rock is a him, will never be put to shame. So that same figure of Jesus Christ you know, in Jerusalem is now this stumbling stone. Some people will get to it and trip and fall. Others will believe in him and never be put to shame. Much like some of the things we've talked about, it still happens today, that predicament still happens to this day. People have a sense of who Jesus is. They've read a bit. They've seen a show. You know, what to do about him? I, say, I don't know. I don't, you know. Are we going to follow him or not? I don't know. Maybe a little, maybe a lot. Maybe I know people, as long as they make it to church, Christmas and Easter, they've done their part. I've had people tell me that, you know. Uh, Is that all it takes? Because it says here, believe in him. The whole package. What does believe in him? The things he did, the things he said. That's how you believe in him. And if you do, you will never be put to shame. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you for your word. And though sometimes difficult to understand, the point is clear. May we put our faith in that solid rock, that firm foundation, which is Christ, and not be put to shame. Thank you for your son. Thank you for this time. Amen. You are dismissed.